friends. Welcome back to another night of 13 nights of Tiki Frights. I hope you have your cocktail ready. Uh, all our cocktails, 13 cocktails, are sponsored by Plantation Rum. And the cocktail recipes were designed for us by Mixing Up Tiki on Instagram. So give them a follow. Uh, tonight's cocktail is called the Headless Horseman. It's a really good one, classic tiki style cocktail. So check it out. Uh, we're super excited tonight uh, for a couple reasons. Hey, we're giving away this uh, beautiful bobble lantern tiki mug uh, from Emporium 32. If you're from the West Coast, you don't know who Emporium 32 is. They are a shop in Salem, Massachusetts, and they are renowned and people love going there for all the spooky stuff this time of year. Uh, they created this mug and we're going to be giving it away later on the live stream. We're also excited because we're talking to Scooter, Scott Burroughs. Scott Burroughs, even if you're not familiar with the name, if you've been following the search for Tiki or 13 Nights at Tiki Frights for the past four years, four seasons, uh, you know and you're familiar with Scott's work because the 13 Nights at Tiki Frights logo was designed by Scott Burroughs Scooter. It's been an amazing logo. I know you guys all love it. You eat the stickers up. Uh, he also designed the Search for Tiki logo. And uh, that was with us from day one. That was our, our brand. Um, Scott Burroughs was amazing uh, to work with uh, for creating that logo. And I'm super excited to talk to him. So without further ado, we're going to bring in Scott after a brief logo. What's happening, buddy? What's up, Gabe? It's so good to see you. Good to see you, man. It's been too long. I think the last time I saw you was, maybe it was Arizona. It was Arizona. We almost met up in Kauai, but- Yeah, yeah we coincidentally were yeah. on the island of Kauai at the same time. Yeah. I I had all of our, well, my, my side of the family was there, so it just was intense and we did a lot. Had a great time, but it just, it was just a busy time, so. But yeah. I love Kauai. Yeah. It's an, is that your favorite island? That is literally my favorite place in the world. <laughs> yeah. Favorite place in the world. There you in go. In the world. Yeah. In the world. I, I kind of agree with you, but I would be a little more specific. Hanalei is my favorite place in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that, Hanalei. Yeah. And it's there's, really I've gorgeous. got like uh, uh, my favorite beach is there and my wife's favorite beach is there. So every time we go, that's like the first thing. As long as we hit those, then the rest of the week we can do whatever. So. Is it a secret beach? It's a, it's a secret beach. Okay. I don't know if any beach is really secret. They're not secret. Hawaii at this point, uh, you know, but some are perhaps a little less crowded than others. So. Well, sometimes people, they get upset if you share about beach locations or names, which I found out. So they do. Yes. Yeah. yeah Particularly so, because okay. for people that don't know, uh, I believe every beach with the exception of military mm -hmm. um, is public. Yeah. Nobody owns the yeah. beaches in Hawaii. Now the access to the beaches can be privately owned. And that's where people sometimes get in trouble because yeah. you know to get to the beach, you're hiking through someone's backyard. Yeah. Which would be very we didn't annoying. do that. All of our favorite beaches are public access, but some of them are some pretty crazy trails to get to them. But that's that's what makes it fun. So a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, dude, I'm so excited. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. You've been Absolutely. a part of the, the search for Tiki history and 13 Nights of Tiki Frights history since day one, designing our logos. So thank you so much again. Oh, man. It's, it was, it's been a pleasure working with you the past few years. So I love it. You always have fun projects. I'm excited to uh, dig a little deeper, get to know the background yeah. of Scooter. Uh, real quick for people, um, Scooter uh, worked for Sega. He worked as a Disney animator during the, uh, the renaissance of Disney, as you would say. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been doing uh, fine art, you know, as a private artist for 20 years. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Although he's still working with some big brands, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, <laughs> but before we get into that, let's, let's just talk about, you know, getting started. Uh, did drawing come naturally to you? When did you begin to draw? Um, I, gosh, I don't know if it came natural. I was like a horrible student in school. So like I grew up with a learning disability. So like math, English, science, history, I just, I was horrible at that, but I could draw. 
So uh, anytime I had free time in school, all the way from, you know, kindergarten up through, you know, graduation, I was always drawing. And um, so I think, you know, if you're in school and you're, you don't do too well at like, you know, more the academic type stuff, um, art is where I just really had a good time, made me feel good about myself. So I would spend most of my time drawing and not really focused on studies of okay. the other <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so, but it worked out. This is, um, it didn't dawn on me till just now, but I had a friend uh, in high school who I won't name, uh, but he also drew a lot and yeah. we all loved his drawings. And, and one day we were watching a movie, you know, like when the, the teacher has no curriculum, they put on a movie and they're like, yeah, you go watch it. Uh, yeah. Well, he drew a character that perhaps he shouldn't know. And the teacher caught him doing it and went to uh, get the note. And you could see like the cogs turning in his mind. He was like, this is not gonna, be good for me if I hand yeah. over this note. So he ate it. He crumpled up the paper and he literally ate it. it. Now, in fairness to him, he got in trouble, but I think he got in less trouble than he would have. Wow. If he had not eaten the note. So yeah. <laughs> were you I'm, were you in trouble a lot? Like uh um, being distracted and stuff? You know, I think through uh well with my art, high school and maybe up into college. I would do more kind of edgy stuff because I thought it got more uh, more attention. It's like a comedian okay. who uses cuss words or whatever just to kind of get that that instant laugh. So um, so yeah, in high school and college, I was kind of more on the edgy side just because I I was trying to find myself as an artist and like who am I? And I was like, oh, that gets a reaction, so I would do that. Um, but then towards the end of college, when I really figured out what I wanted to do, that's when. Um, I don't know. I didn't feel like I needed to, you know, make up, you know, something that might get like a, you know, get somebody's attention just because it's jarring. And, yeah. uh, but, but in high school and beginning of college, I definitely did that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the only time I got in trouble was, um, it was in high school and we were, it was like, we we're supposed to do something that was historical. So I was like, um, I'll do something with Hitler. So I did this, this like Hitler watercolor painting and um, it was pretty good. Like I wasn't like, I don't think, you know, Nazis are good or Hitler, like anything like that. But I just was like, Ooh, this, this might is not where I thought this interview was going to yeah. go tonight. I'm like, this will, get, this will get some attention. So I did it. And then it was, it turned out really well. And my art teacher, like they, they ended up hanging in the office with a bunch of other art. But then um, somebody saw it, and so it kind of went to the school board. They're like, "You shouldn't have that hanging in the office." So they they took it down, and then I got a talking to. But that's that's probably the most trouble I got into <laughs> for, for doing something. That's not bad. Yeah, I mean, they put it up right initially, so yeah, there, there must have been some artistic value credit to it. Yeah, so it random. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what kind of, uh, so you drew in, in high school, what's your formal art training background? Did you go to school, like college for, for art? Yeah. So, um, I started off in a community college out in California. I was in the Bay area. And, um, one day, uh, my wife and I, we were walking in downtown San Francisco and we were in Macy's and in the bottom section, they had kind of like a mural that had a picture of Powell street. And I was looking at the mural and up Powell Street, I saw a sign for Academy of Art College. Now it's Academy of Art University, but I saw Academy of Art College was up on Powell Street. And I was like, ooh, it's an art school. So when I got back, this is, you know, before the inner, you know, before you could go online and look it up. I went to the library and looked up the school. I was like, this looks really cool. So um, I was finishing up in community college and then uh, put an application in at Academy of Art University and got accepted. I think everybody gets accepted, but I got accepted. And that's where I spent uh, the the next three years, you know, kind of working towards what I wanted. So at first I was uh, a sculpting major. And then one day Disney came uh, recruiting because, you know, they they were starting, their movies were starting to do really well. And um, I, was a, I was a starving college student. So I was like, if you went to go here with Disney, I had to say you got free pizza. So I was like, I'm gonna, I'll go and listen to what they have to say. So I sat right in the front, got my pizza. I was totally not into what they were, you know, I was like, I don't even care what they're saying. I'm not interested at all. 
And dude, like legit within about two minutes into the presentation, I knew I was supposed to be a Disney animator. Like I was like, that's what I'm supposed to do. They were showing us, uh, it was the work in progress for Beauty and the Beast. So Beauty and the Beast hadn't been released yet, but the work in progress had like storyboards and rough animation and cleanup animation and uh, layouts. And I just was like, oh my gosh, this is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like I, I watched Disney growing up, but just something clicked in me. I was like, that's what I'm supposed to do. So I switched my major um, and then spent, you know, the next two and a half years working on a portfolio uh, to get hired by Disney. Okay. Real quick. Yeah. Before we get going on Disney. Yeah. Guys, we got these bar mats. This is a tangent, but we got these bar mats that uh, Scott Burroughs designed, Scooter, for the Search for Tiki. They are completely sold out, but we have a limited handful of them that we can give out tonight. So if you write in the comments something that we like, uh, and not necessarily, we might pull up your comments, but... Uh, you'll know we're going to do an alarm. We're going to do like a little slot machine sound. And uh, if we like your comment, either Scott or me likes your comment, then we're going to give you a bar mat for free. So uh, make sure you're typing in the comments all your stuff. But OK, so Disney. Yeah. Um, it took two and a half years of schooling. So you they came and they did this presentation. You went for the pizza. Yeah. But then you were like, hey, I actually want to do this. Two yeah. and a half years later the job was still there? Well, they, um, so they would come once a year recruiting. And so how you used to get hired by Disney is they go to all the colleges. Um, I, well, not all of them, but they probably went to about 12 of the main art schools. And so each year they would send like their, you know, the main guy, his name was Frank Gladstone. He would come out with his team and they would do a portfolio review um, of all the people that wanted to submit for the internship. So if, you know, Frank looked at your portfolio, he's like, yeah, you know, we're going to pay for you to send it in. That was like a good sign. So um, while I was waiting, you know, I worked in my portfolio for two and a half years. I was going to like the Oakland Zoo, the San Francisco Zoo. I was drawing on BART, which is like kind of the train that goes around the Bay Area. I was doing all the workshops. I was like literally insane about working for them. I'd wake up at like four in the morning. I would draw before school. I'd come home. I'd you know, practice drawing and they didn't want to see any Disney characters. They wanted to see like, uh, you know, drawings from life. So um, all my drawings were like animals and people. And so it just spent like, yeah, two and a half years working on putting a portfolio together. And they finally said, you know, send it in. And were these, so at the time you were drawing these, are these like cartoons? Are they like realistic no, portraits? Yeah, it's like what you'd see. They look real, you know, definitely more realistic. They're not cartoony at all. So um, they just want to know that you knew anatomy, that you could draw a figure in motion, whether it's an animal or a person. So they didn't want it to look cartoony. They just wanted to know that you could actually, you know, know how to put a figure in motion, to put a figure where they actually take up space. And so there's definitely things they were looking for. And I had this one teacher, her name was Barbara Bradley, and she just, I would, I really wasn't that great of an artist when I first got there. And she took pity on me and she kind of took me under her wing. <laughs> she spent two and a half years just helping me get to where, you know, my portfolio was good enough. I mean, without her, you know, I never would have done it, but she just, um, you know, if there's like people in your life that have like a profound, like if you didn't meet them, you would be nowhere close to where you were. She was one of those teachers that um, just was instrumental as far as helping me get, you know, my dream of working for Disney. So super, super grateful for those people in my life. <laughs> so thank you to her. Yeah. Thanks to Barbara Bradley. I, we probably wouldn't be here doing this, this, this chat, you know, it's true. Barbara Bradley hadn't been there. So that's kind of cool. It's true. It's true. Um, yeah. I mean, you hear about, um, you know, like the early days of Disney with Walt, um, like Bambi and, uh, they would bring in, you know, actual deer, you know, and draw the deer. But it's got to be hard. You work two and a half years on a profile yeah. or a portfolio for uh -huh. Disney that's not Disney. Yeah. And then you get to Disney and then you have to learn the Disney style. Right. So that's. Yeah. But that's like more their, work. Their philosophy was they could teach you their style. They just wanted to know that you knew how to draw. So um, that was kind of their philosophy. But like there was other students. So I I didn't go to an animation school. So my. I was more in illustration. That was as close as I could get to Disney. But there were some schools that are strictly animation schools. And so not only did they have the skills of like figure drawing and animals and all that, but they also had animation skills. But 
once once you get once you get to Disney, like the internship's basically a boot camp where you're like you try all these different you know departments like background, rough animation, cleanup animation, storyboarding, and um, you spend three months kind of working on all these you know figuring out what where you might enjoy being, and then at the end of it, they're like they decide if, if you're hireable or not hireable. So. Um, but there was 13, there was 13 of us in my internship and all of us got hired. Some of us went to the Florida studio. I was at the Florida studio. And then some of us went to the California studio. Okay. So did you have to, to relocate? Um, yeah. So, but you know, I think, cause we'd been in California for a while and I love the Bay area, but I was just like, you know, I wanted a new adventure. So, um, we decided, Hey, let's go to Florida and, um, it was awesome. Like I love the Florida studio. It had a great community of artists. Um, I was there, you know, when we first started off, we were in trailers because um, the Florida studio actually started in the theme park. Um, they were just kind of giving like a couple artists, you know, a small scenes to work on so that when people were in the Florida, you know, they would go to, it was um, the animation walk. So they had kind of like, it was called a fishbowl where you'd see animators working. So at first it was maybe like five animators um, and they'd work on actual films, but it just kept growing because, you know, it was when Disney was just kicking out a ton of movies. And so it grew from like those five animators to where, you know, when, when they closed the studio, when I was there, there was over 300 artists, you know, in all different departments. It's kind of shocking to think about, but um, I guess one of the questions I have for you, I was talking to Jeff Granito a couple of years ago. Jeff Granito mm -hmm. has also worked with Disney. Uh, I don't think he's animated any movies, but he does a lot of the merchandise and products with Disney for the Disney parks. Um, and when he started working, he said that uh, it was not, it's kind of weird to think about, but being a, you know, a Disney employee was not a coveted thing because Disney was the old movies that kind of fallen out of fashion. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until later nowadays, like it's incredibly difficult to get a job you know, yeah. one of these jobs that we're talking about at Disney. So I'm curious, when you started working there, uh, what, were, were the positions really coveted? Uh, <laughs> or, or did that did that come, you know, maybe a few years later as you were working there? It was stupid competitive when I was trying to get in there. Like, just like, so there was, um, they would do two internships a year. And so they would get over 5,000 submissions and then they'd pick like, you know, maybe like 25 people for the whole year out of that. So um, it was like, I, I believe in miracles. I believe I got in there. It was a miracle that I actually got in there. So I don't um, think so. I don't think so. It, it was, I, I mean, miracles. Yes, but there's talent. I think you're yeah. selling yourself short. Yeah. But I, I, I like, it was a great experience. It was really competitive getting to get in there. But then the fun part is you become friends with all of these amazing artists. Like, you know, I was meeting people that were legends in the field that I knew about, you know, when I was a college student just wanting to get in. And then you get to meet them and you become friends with them and you're working on their scenes or, you know, we played a ton of foosball. That was like kind of our. OK, life, you know? so <laughs> you'd be playing foosball with some of these people that were like, you know, heroes to you. And now you're working with them and they become friends. And there was a really cool culture where the, uh, you know, like the, the upper animators would love to kind of pour into like the new people coming in, you know, like me. And it was so awesome. It wasn't like people were like trying to hold, you know, like this is just my talent. I'm not going to share it. Like it was really a great place to go and learn. It was like the, it was the best art school I could have ever gone to, you know, I, so I was there for 10 years and I learned so much from so many different, you know, amazing artists. Speaking of um, other artists, mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe a lot of the characters in Disney movies, right? There's too much for one person to do. So right. yeah. different animators will animate different parts, you know, yeah. how, what are some of the ways that they make uh, the characters look the same? Like, yeah, right. Drawing, <laughs> you know, but when we watch the movies, we can't tell, you know, you guys know what you drew, but when we watch it. Oh, yeah, it's like I can watch a scene, I can watch a scene that, you know, say Mulan, which was um, all of Florida, uh, Florida film. We used California to help out on, you know, some parts of it, but it was mostly Florida, maybe like, you know, 95% Florida. I can watch the, I can watch that film and tell like, you know, what scenes were done, like, oh, this is totally Florida or like, you know, oh, you can. California. yeah. And not like in a bad way, but like you really know, like if the main so so the beginning of every movie they do kind of what's called baseball trading. So 
they're like, okay, we're going to work on, you know, Mulan. And so they'd say what characters, you know, they'd be pitching the movie to us kind of leading up to it. And then right when they're starting to bring people on, they'd say, you know, what characters do you want to work on? So you'd like, you put your top three choices. And then each character has what's called the lead, which is kind of like the boss of that character. And they're the ones that really, this, they supervise, they oversee every part of it to make sure it has a consistent look to it. So you'd be like, so uh, so with Mulan, I, I worked on Shane. So um, I, my, my boss, his name was Brian, Brian Summers, we called him Bree. And so his job working with us was to make sure that all of our drawings looked like one person did it. So. Um, so he's like the main guy. So he'd do like, you know, the, the most important, the key, key drawings. And then it kind of would trickle down to, you know, depending on where your position is, you'd be doing, you know, more difficult, or if you're just starting out, you're called an in-betweener, which you're basically like a human Xerox machine. You're, you know, you're, you're not doing, you're being creative, but you're not getting to be as creative, you know, if the, like, you know, the higher up people. So when you get there, there's something in you where you're just like, I'm so excited to work on this film. I'm excited to be, you know, an in-betweener. But um, I think most artists, you're always wanting to get better. So, you know, I think I was there for like two months, you know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm an in-betweener. I'm so excited. And I was excited about being an in-betweener, but, the, you know, within two months, I'm like, you know, I want to become a breakdown. Like that's next. And, you know, then an assistant. So, the whole, I think most people while you're there, like you're always excited, you know, to like, to, you know, bring your skill to the next level. So it was never boring because you just felt like you're always being pushed and um, you would get like a mentor. Disney was really good as far as like giving mentors. And so um, when you're an intern, they give you a mentor. But as soon as I finished, I actually went and got my own. They don't give you mentors after you finish the internship and you kind of start. But I was like, dude, I want to learn. So I'll, I want to work with somebody that actually is where I want to be. And so I asked uh, a good friend. Uh, his name was Rob. So I'm like, dude, will you mentor me? He was like, you know, high up there. So he spent, you know, a couple of years working with me and just helping me, you know, learn animation and drawing better. And um, so it was it was never boring you always felt like you're trying to get better and um and it was just always fun to work as a team you know releasing these films out to the world and we're always excited yeah. to see how they did so uh, usually pretty good usually yeah usually pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so you're you're assigned characters did you mm -hmm. ever have a character that you were assigned to work on and you're like wow like I, I'm not really digging this. I don't, this is not my favorite character or maybe not my favorite style. No, you know, honestly, when I was there, I pretty much loved working on everybody. Some of them were difficult. Like, um, so for example, you know, if uh, Shang and Mulan, sometimes he's on his horse. So you're drawing a guy on a horse. And so those drawings would take a lot longer. When I was working on Emperor's New Groove, um, I was working on Pacha, and that was more of a cartoony style. Um, Mulan was very, almost like Sleeping Beauty. It was very designy, mm -hmm. and um, so there's some movies that are more cartoony. They're more loose, and you can, you know, have a little bit more leeway with them. And other ones are extremely designy. Like each drawing is, you know, angular and it has to look a certain way. So, you know, certain films were more time consuming and other ones were more kind of loosey goosey as you went. So, but they were all fun. Like, you know, I, you, you'd have a long day. Like when we were finishing up the film, we typically, you know, overtime would hit. And I think, um, you know, like Mulan or Lilo and Stitch ones that we did in the Florida studio, usually like the last three months I was working every single day. I'd get there at like six in the morning and, you know, leave at like, you know, seven or eight at night. And uh, it was pretty crazy, but um, it was worth just, it. yeah, it was, it, was like, worth it. <laughs> it was, it was worth it to a point, but then at a certain point, you're like, holy cow. I mean, we'd freak out this be, you know, we'd be working late at night and you had like, kind of like, you know, cut loose or whatever. So sometimes we, um, we take golf carts. We weren't supposed to do this. And we're like literally booking through um, the, the, um, the theme parks, going downstairs, stuff we weren't supposed to do. One time we rolled the golf cart, you know, near one of the rides. This is, you know, it's dark at night, but that was on uh, Hunchback. But, you know, you're just like, you sit at your desk so long, um, you're just like, I have to go do something. So you, you kind of get crazy there at night <laughs> towards the end of a film. We had a, a question that's kind of a flip of the question I asked yeah. uh, before, you know, if there were any characters you really didn't like. Scotty, uh, first of all, I think uh, I think your question deserves a bar mat. 
right? I think and Scotty's so question mean, deserves a bar mat. So Scotty, hit us up at admin at searchfortiki.com and claim your bar mat. But uh, his question was, what is your all-time favorite character to draw? Gosh. Okay. First, I'll say my all-time favorite character. Then I'll tell you my all-time favorite character to draw. So in okay. Sleeping in Sleeping Beauty, it was the horse. Um, I just thought um, that horse was so amazing. So I assume that's your favorite character, and that you were not around for Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> that, but I got to work on it. You know, I got to work on a horse later. Gosh. So I think. Um, I think with like Lilo and Stitch, I worked on uh, I worked on several characters in that, but I worked on Pleakley. He's like the guy with three legs and one eye, and he was so fun to work on just because he was so cartoony and kind of crazy, and it's, the dialogue from the actor was amazing. So I think he was definitely one of my favorite characters to work on. And we can pull up a photo of uh, Pleakley here so people yeah. can know. <laughs> but yeah, um, you also mentioned Emperor's New Groove. Emperor's New Groove, that's, yeah. I think that's my favorite Disney movie. It's kind of a weird one. It's, a, it's, it's kind of weird. A movie. Yeah, but yeah. it's so funny. It's hilarious. Yeah. I can't watch it without laughing hysterically. Uh, what was the first movie that you, you worked on uh, at Disney? So when I was an intern, they had us help out on Pocahontas. So that was the first, you know, first one I worked on. So I remember the very first drawing I did um it probably took me like five hours <laughs> you know yeah there's pleakley <laughs> so he's got two tongues you know he's, he's a crazy character his walk cycle was totally crazy it didn't make sense <laughs> his legs would almost like spin around in a way that you know was impossible but it just worked really well so ruben Which i never would have thought of and yeah so really know, was the lead animator on him and just came up with some really really fun ways to move him around so um yeah, so he was, he was great to work on. Um, were there uh, were there any scenes that you worked on uh, that never saw the light of day that you were like, hmm, I yeah, really like that you, animation? You definitely have those. Um, I was pretty lucky. I didn't have as many, but like, you know, that's just part of it. So, so an example would be with uh, Lilo and Stitch. Um, so that was right when 9/11 was happening. So we were actually working when when all that when all that happened, and we were we were close to the end of the movie. And there was a scene where um, Stitch actually gets a 747 and is flying it through like downtown. Um, I guess it was like Honolulu, like through buildings and all of that. And it was wow. just like you're just like we can't do that. So they totally kind of had to scrap that. They got rid of the 747 and then the characters were more in um, like an alien ship and they just kind of changed it. So um, a lot of work went into that, um, but, you know, they had to change it. Um, but I love what they changed it to. I thought it was super funny. So but that typically happens, um, you know, with with the films I worked on, like the store department is literally holding on to like, you know, holding on to it as long as they can because they're just trying to make it better and better. And then as production gets close to the end, like you have the deadline, like, okay, the movie's being released here. So everybody has to be done here. And so as this gets closer, it's just like the work starts to pile up. And that's why like, you know, the end of, you know, production, everybody's working all these crazy hours, but like, you know, the story department is, is holding on, you know, to the story as long as they can, ready to make any changes. They're constantly doing screenings of the film, um, you know, as we go through it. And so you, you have a sense of where it's going. So if there's ever any problems like story-wise, they do screenings. If there's a problem, then, you know, they'd go in and change stuff. And that's typically where you'd lose, you know, a scene or two that maybe you worked on. But it's just, I guess you get used to it. You're like, all right, you know, if the movie's better, that's what matters. Yep. So. As an animator, were you kind of like clued into the whole big picture? Or, you, or, or uh, did you just have the scenes that you were working on and maybe not the full scope of the film. Well, I think the Florida studio was more, um, it was a smaller studio. And so I think um, you really got to know so many people. So you had a pretty good idea what was going on everywhere. Like, you know, you're becoming friends with people who are playing foosball with the story department or, you know, director, you know, you know, the directors and, cause lots of times the directors were animators that they moved up. And so the longer you work there, then you know, sometimes you think of as directors, like, you know, some, oh, they're like so high up, I can't talk to them. But most of most of the time they're like friends that you've known for years and you're just, you're excited. You're like, dude, you're directing this, this is awesome. And so you really, you know, 
you could be as involved as you wanted. And I loved being involved. Like if I'm here, I'm all in, I want to know what's going on, you know, you know, what's happening. So, um, so you could totally do that if you wanted to. And I did that. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, as those deadlines that you're talking about come up, yeah. um, what does that look like? What is, what is your week? You it, have doesn't, to- it doesn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look good. Um, you just kind of, you know, you, you, you just kind of suck it up and you do it. Um, they took really good care of us. Like, you know, they would feed us. They're just like, whatever they could do to keep us in front of our desk, they would do. Like one time I got jury duty and I was excited because I was like, I just need a break. So I had to go to human resources and, you know, let them know like, hey, I've got jury duty. So I'm probably going to be out a couple of days. They're like, no, we can get you out of that. Like, give me your notice. And they called and they got no. me Yeah. Like, yeah, it was like legit. What They would do what they needed to do to keep you at your desk drawing. So. Okay. Just, I, okay. This is this story at first. Okay. I was like, wow, you actually wanted to go to jury duty. Mm-hmm. I thought that was the punchline. Dude, I was no, tired. The punchline is you weren't able to do it. <laughs> I was so, I was so t- Yeah, I was on it. Actually, so I'm right-handed and I hold my pencil kind of weird. You're not supposed to hold it like this. I hold it weird. And so I tip it, you know, when I was working on films, I get like this massive callus right here. And I would come home during overtime. My wife's name's Christy. And I'm like, you know, I've been drawing for like nine hours straight and my hand was like a claw. And she'd have to like massage it out, you know. And it was just, you know, it's not like I'm some big sports guy that like played in this massive game and I have wounds or whatever, but I'd literally come home with a claw that, you know, you have to rub it out. So it was typically the last few months of films were pretty intense, you know, on marriages, on, you know, with kids, like all of that stuff, just because you're, you're so in it trying to finish and you don't want to let people down. And, um, but it was, you know, it, it still was so much fun doing it. So it, it's basically a family career. Yeah. If you yeah. have an animator in the house, the whole family is involved. Because yeah. Yeah. And like everybody knew, um, you know, even once, uh, like, so my boss, Bree, Brian, Bree, like, um, there was one time I went for promotion and he actually told uh, my wife, Christy, that I got it before he told me. Cause like, we were all friends. We all hung out, you know, cause I was, I was stressing. I'm like, gosh, I really hope I get this promotion or whatever. And, and, uh, I, I was with a group of people and I was talking to somebody else and, you know, Bree looked at Christy. He's like, he got it. So, you know, it, that's the kind of atmosphere it was like, you know, it was very close knit and, and friendly, you know, it, you know, similar to like, I don't know, it's like, it's like friends in high school without having to go to school, you're just having fun and you've got great community and you just, you're just enjoying it. That's how it was when I was there. Okay. Yeah. Nowadays, uh, Wait, I got, I got so Shane just asked a question. So let's give Shane a bar mat. And he's like, Were there ever any awkward moments at the fishbowl in MGM Studios. So, Scooter has picked you as a winner of a bar yeah. mat. So this wasn't me, but I love what this guy did. So his name was Will, and Will was in the fishbowl. And so Will loved Mountain Dew, but instead of drinking out of a Mountain Dew container, he put it in a pickle jar. So he'd have this oh. pickle jar full of Mountain Dew and he would just drink it as people were, you know, walking by the fishbowl. <laughs> I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> and people are like, ew. But I, was like, <laughs> I just thought that was such a fun thing to, you know, just to, just to keep it fun. So that is excellent. Yeah. Congratulations, Shane. Send me yep. an email at admin at searchpertiki.com to claim your bar mat and we'll ship it to you. Um, it's very common nowadays, particularly in like Silicon Valley, Google, Apple, to kind of create these spaces that are designed uh, to make their employees stick around after hours, right? With, uh, mm-hmm. you know, gym fitness equipment and cafes, because they're, you know, the more that their employees interact, the more chance there is for like creativity and ideas and stuff. Mm-hmm. Was Disney doing that back then during the, the animation? They did as best. Um... They did it really well. When I first got there, like I said, we were in trailers because the the, the studio started really small. So they're just like, um, they're big trailers, but it was still like, you know, manufactured trailer buildings. And so the first couple of movies I worked on, we were in that. But then as um, the movies were more successful, they decided they were gonna build a studio in Florida. And so when they did that, one of the, the main things they did is they had this kind of the courtyard in the center of, you know, there's like two main buildings with this massive courtyard and a food court. And, and so they did that because they learned in the uh, California studio, 
it was hard for people to meet up in certain places. And so they really wanted to create an area that like for gathering. And so like whenever we had parties, you know, we'd, we'd use that place and, you know, everybody would eat lunch there. And so they, it really, you know, created that community, which was awesome. And so that was something I think they learned from California that they didn't have. So they, they really wanted people to get along and have, you know, friends and stuff like that. So I think they, the studio they built there was just awesome as far as like kind of, you know, bringing people together, making, you know, making it enjoyable to be there, you know, when the, the hours are crazy. So, no. but I'll say this, when they, when it wasn't crazy, um, it was called downtime. So downtime was okay. magical. So downtime was like, Hey, we just finished a movie and we don't start the next one for six months. And so you can just work on tests. You can go to the park, you can do whatever you want. So like, I think once there was like six months without, I didn't have to do anything in particular. Another, it was between movies. Another one was like eight months. And so people did all sorts of things. So like, typically what I would do is I, they were called tests. So if I wanted to get promoted, I would just like, you know, I'd work on doing like, you know, 10 or 20 second animation tests, working on my skills. And then, you know, about twice a year they'd have, uh, review boards, look at all the animation. That's how you got promoted. So typically in downtime, I would do that, but there was, there was also a ton of free time. So you're seeing movies, you know, foosball, ping pong, park walks, you know, all this stuff. So, so even though I, you know, it was insane for like the overtime, I think there's also those times where, you know, Disney knew like, Hey, it's, you, you had a good, you had a good run, you know, kind of leading up yeah. to this production. So, so you're going to be okay working all that time at the end. So we're gonna we're gonna ease off you know, yeah over because we know we got another movie coming down the pipeline yeah. and we're gonna need this guy to do the, the 70 hour work yeah. <laughs> was, yeah right there was one time so this was tarzan and um we weren't supposed to work on tarzan at the florida studio and then i heard it was coming so i found out who the producer was his name was bruce and i was kind of friends with him I'm like bruce i want to work on tarzan like what 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 can you do to get me on Tarzan? So, and we were in downtime from, you know, another film. So he was able to get me on that. So there was some like, you know, there was, you know, you knew the right people um, that you could go to that you're friends with. You'd be like, Hey, I'd love to work on this. They would do your best. You know, you're working with your friends are like, okay, cool. I'll try to get you on. So, you know, he was able to get me onto Tarzan, which was a lot of fun. That was a great, you know, that was super fun to work on. I remember seeing that was that was um, I saw that in the theaters uh, and it was yeah. the last time I saw our movie and I was living in Skowhegan, Maine at the time and it made a huge impact on me because it was so I don't know there was something about Tarzan that just hit different than any of the other movies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, my hero, like Glenn Keane, he's like you know the the animator. If I could be any animator, I wanted to be Glenn Keane, and um, he was actually in Paris. So at one point we had the California studio, we had the Florida studio, and then we had like a small satellite studio in Paris. And so Glenn Keane, he's like just an amazing artist all around. He could pretty much do anything, but he was at the Paris studio and he was the main animator on Tarzan. And uh, I had this friend, Saul, Saul's now a big, you know, he's a big time director, but um, Saul knew that I loved Glenn Keane. And so he reached out to him in Paris. He's like, hey, you know, Glenn, my name's Saul, I'm the Florida studio. You know, I work with my friend Scott. He's just like this huge fan of yours, you know, talks about you, all this kind of stuff. And um, he's like, is there any way you could do a drawing, you know, for Scott for of Tarzan? And so he did this, gosh, I don't know if you can see it, but no, you can't, it's behind me. But he did this awesome drawing of Tarzan, um, which, you know, he was super busy and typically, you know, lots of times you can ask an animator to do that, but you usually know who they are. He didn't know who I was and just the nicest guy did this awesome drawing, you know, of Tarzan, you know, he even said it, you know, the date on it and said, you know, from Paris. And it was just like, just the nicest guy giving just like a gift that I just was blown away, you know, blown away on. So yeah, it's <laughs> super special. People, those are the things that we cherish, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. Every, everybody's got those things that we love. Um, yeah. I would love to talk to you about Disney forever, <laughs> but <laughs> uh i have so many other things i want to talk to you about yeah so, yeah i am curious how the disney how did disney impact your your career in fine art yeah like um gosh i think before i got to disney like i knew what i needed to do to work for disney but i wouldn't say i was like a well-rounded artist like i could draw but 
my color wasn't that great. And, you know, as far as like, you know, composition, I mean, I was, I was probably okay, but I was nowhere, you know, where I am now. So I think I learned a lot of that from Disney. And then um, I think it was interesting when Disney was finishing, uh, like probably a year before they were finishing, I'm like, I want to illustrate a children's book. I had never done that before. Uh -huh. And so like, you know, I bought a, an, a computer, bought, you know, Photoshop and illustrator. And I'm just like, I'm going to learn, you know, how to do this. And so I didn't, I didn't know what to illustrate. So I just was like, um, I had a Bible and I was like, I'll do something from like, you know, David and Goliath or, you know, Daniel Lyons Den, something I don't have to write, just something I could illustrate. So I think it was David and Goliath because I just wanted to come up with an awesome character design for Goliath. Like, and, um, and you could see, like, as I started to work on that, like, uh, Ward Kimball, he was like one of the old animators, but he was amazing. And like his style, I looked at all the time. And so when I, when it came to designing, you know, character, you know, that wasn't a Disney character, you could totally see where like that had influenced me. And so I think that was something, that's one example, but as, as I left Disney, it definitely had like a huge impact on, you know, my art. Um, I'm, you know, I, I think lots of times people could look at my stuff and they, if I say I worked for Disney, like, oh, I can totally see that. So it definitely influenced who I am today. And like, right when I, when I first left, I didn't think that was a good thing. I was like, I don't want, I don't want it to look like Disney. I want it, you know, to look like something else. And then, you know, then I came to realize I'm like, but this is who I am. Like, you know, and I'm not trying to make something up, but this is my history. Like, this is how I learned to draw for 10 years. And, and so I think, you know, at first when I didn't really want that now, like I totally embrace it. I'm super grateful for it. I'm like, that's what helped me make the artist I am today. So um, it's fully, you know, if you look at my style and you're like, oh, he worked for Disney, then people, you know, could be like, oh, I can totally see that. So, um, I do think, I mean, it's, 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 it's a style that, I mean, Disney movies are popular for a reason, right? It's, it's yeah. a style that speaks to millions of people across the, the globe, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting, it, that, yeah. like as an artist, I think, you know, we can be mental at times, you know, when it comes to like, well, I have to have my own style and, you know, all this. So I think for, for, for a lot of artists, it's like, you're trying to find your voice. Like, who am I? Like, what am I, what kind of art am I putting out there? What's my story? What do I want? What do I want to be known by? And I'm, I wasn't like super deep like that, but I think the more you embrace, like, you know, this is who I am, this is my history. And you start moving in that you, you tend to kind of move away from, you know, when I first left, I'm sure it was way more Disney to where I am now, where, you know, it is, it's, it's a version of that, but I've progressed, you know, that was like, you know, 20 something years ago that I worked there. You're, you kind of find your style and your voice and it just kind of becomes something else, but it's definitely influenced by, you know, the past that I had there. So I'm grateful for it. Like, I love that opportunity. Um, I want to pull up a couple pieces, uh, yeah. recent, re semi-recent pieces that you've done, tiki pieces, uh, particularly uh, uh, Chanted Tiki Rum and Kikiki Tiki Supper Club, um, yeah. because they, I, to me, they kind of have some of that Disney Disney vibe. We'll show some other ones too. But so this is the the, the uh, Kikiki Tiki Kikiki Tiki Supper Club. Yeah, actually, I've never been there, but I had friends that went there. It was in Columbus, Ohio, and. Um, just an amazing place and so it was like before disney built the florida you know the parks in florida a lot of the um imagineering actually went to the kahiki tiki because it was very themed out and they would take notes from it and that that definitely had an influence on what you know some of the lands and you know the parks look like after it but um it closed down it's like one of those sad things where like you know they were you know there's a couple statues left and i think it's a it's a walgreens now or something <laughs> something oh, so okay. bad, but. it is it's one of those i like one of the tg temples that people talk about you know and, and they say you know i wish i could have gone there but i can't yeah um and it's one of those things that i always when people bring that up it's like okay when if a lot of these places went out of business one of the key reasons they did it is because there weren't people going to them right yeah. so rather than Kind of be sad about the places that we can't go to yeah uh, go support your local tiki bar yeah i love, I love like i'm always looking for stories you know behind it so they had the mystery girl which is like you know the server in the front that's holding the massive you know tiki bowl and so they would ring the gong and then the mystery girl would come out and she's the only one that's dressed specifically like that and mm -hmm. this awesome like 
massive tiki bowl with like, you know, the flame going on. And, and so whenever she came out, it was like this big event, like everybody would stop and kind of watch. So I, I was like, I have to incorporate that. And then I think with a lot of my art, like I, I just really enjoy portraying like romance. Um, I'm like a total romantic. I love like Hallmark movies, <laughs> anything about love. I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's like, that makes my heart happy. So most of the work I do definitely has to do with like romance and love and, you know, stuff like that. So I try to get some of that in there. <laughs> what does that mean every Christmas you disappear because you're on the on the Hallmark channel every night? Right. <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already excited for Christmas movies to start next. Oh, of course, you're on. I have issues. I have issues. I watch yeah. Christmas movies. <laughs> I like Christmas too, but yeah. I like Halloween. So, you know, yep. come November 1st, I'm ready. You're in, yeah. October 31st, no. It's 13 yep. nights at Tiki Bites. <laughs> Don't put the Christmas trees out. Right, right. <laughs> um, we have a, a, a sketch here, the Gong concept art. Um, of the girl in the background. We talked about the girl here in the front. Let's see if we can um, pull up the photo here in a second. Uh, okay. but, um, I think it's cool because you you draw in red pencil. Yeah, that was just, that's, you know, that's how I learned at Disney. And I just love like, um, there's, I have lots of friends that just draw everything on the computer, but I just love paper and pencil, like just, you know, makes me happy. And I just love having that sketch. Um, even when I worked at Disney, I would bug my friends for drawings, like from scenes. I'm like, just give me a drawing. They're like, oh my gosh, like, okay, here. So I literally have a box full of just thousands of drawings from when I was there, because I think there's something special about a drawing where you are at, it's, it's actually the artist's time. Like they spent a certain amount of time on that. So uh, same thing's true with a, you know, an original painting or a sculpt, something that like a human hand is touched to me, that's like, you're literally getting some time from it. I think there's something so special about it. So, so with a lot of my drawings, um, I just like, people like those. So I like to make those available to people or, you know, when I'm working with my, you know, friends at Disney, I just would ask them for drawings. I just love drawings and I always have. So. <laughs> um, this one here, this is another Tiki piece, um, uh, mm -hmm. called the, uh, People might be able to guess. People might be able to guess. Tiki room. Yeah. Enchanted Tiki Room. I yeah. love that. Uh, so it's it, it's obviously, you know, our, one of our favorite locations uh, here on the Search for Tiki. Uh, but I love all the little details you put on the shelves. Um, yeah, there's definitely, I, I put some, you know, I snuck some Lilo and Stitch type stuff in there, some Jaws in there, some Star Wars. You know, I'm just like, is there, you know, hopefully not that I'd get in trouble, but like, it looks close enough. You'd be like, is, is that Jaws or is that a TIE fighter? Or, you know, does that have something to do with Lilo and Stitch? Um, you know, like getting Lilo's, you know, the pattern of her dress is on um, one of the pieces up there. And so just little Easter eggs to stick in there is like super fun for me to, to get that in. Cause people love that. It's just like, you know, they'll look at it. Um, I do this with commissions too. If I work with somebody on their own piece of art, I love to just hide st stuff in there that like, if they mention something to me, I'll put that in as an Easter egg. And, you know, it'll be months later. They're like, did you actually hide this in there? I just saw it. So I love that where it's almost like the back of a cereal box where like you're trying to find something. It's a puzzle. Like I love kind of incorporating that into pieces like this. Yep. 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 And the, uh, the girl in the front and then yeah. dude, I just love looking at all of your, all, all the people you do. Cause you can tell, uh, that there's a story with each one, you know, like you can almost imagine them as, as, as actual people. This must go back to Disney. I would assume. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, you know, as an artist, there's times where I can just, I can put out like, um, you know, like an image that looks just like slick and it's, you know, it just looks good. But if it doesn't have story, it's like, you know, you might look at it, you're like, okay, that's cool, but you're not going to spend, you know, a lot of time on it where if there is a story and it hits your heartstrings, it evokes an emotion. Um, it reminds you of something, or you can see yourself in that piece of art. Like to me, that's, that's one of the fun challenges that I get to kind of go through. It's like, how do I get people to see themselves in this piece of art or to see somebody they knew or to like uh, evoke an uh, emotion or memory? Um, to me, that is like such a fun challenge that um, that I really enjoy um, more so than just creating like a, you know, a slick image. Like I'm, I'd rather have my art skills be less than but have better story than just like amazing art skills, but no story. I kind of, I'm bent towards the story. And that's definitely from Disney too. It's all story, story, story driven, so. It makes it makes it easier because you, if you have just a blank page, right? Yeah, it's, it's really that's like that writer's block. I don't know if there's a 
there's another word for writer's block for art. You're not <laughs> writing. I, I mean, I guess you're you're drawing. Um, but I don't know, like you, because I. Uh, that's a good question. Like I know, because you had mentioned, like you know, what is it like? Where does inspiration come from, or how do you have inspiration if you have writer's block? I think when you. Um, you know, doing what I'm doing, you know, uh, bef you know, when, when I was working at Sega, they're like, okay, here's the scene you need to work on. It doesn't matter if you, you're inspired or not. It's like, it's a job. You have to get it done. So like, it's not like you're waiting for inspiration. You treat it like you, you know, it's a business, like they're paying you money to come up with something. And so, you know, lots of times inspiration comes when you sit down at the desk, you turn that computer on, or you sit at the easel and you start painting. It's like, that's what, for me, that's what makes inspiration come. So, um, there's times where maybe I'm not as creative. And so when I have those times, say I'm working on a piece and I'm like, I'm not feeling super creative on this person, but I know I could work on the background. So like I'll kind of bounce around a piece or maybe I'll, you know, work on a different painting or a couple paintings at, you know, one time. And so I think that's one way where like, um, if I'm, you know, not feeling it on one, I can bounce to the other, or if I'm not, you know, Creatively, if I don't feel like I have it fully here, then if I work on something else, I know when I come back to it that it'll be there. So I think multiple pieces and just, you know, sometimes just like being a professional artist, it's like you you just have to show up. You can't just be like, well, I'm just going to wait. You know, I, <laughs> I've i never been like that. I, I never would want to be like that. Like when I sit down, I'm there to take care of business and have fun, but I'm there to take care of business. So you ever just like set it aside though? I mean, not, not a commissioned work, but maybe you're working on something and you just encounter it and you're like, you know what? I'm going to come back to this. I'll probably get real frustrated. <laughs> I'll probably get frustrated and keep trying to fix it. That's that's okay. typically what I would do. Because I think... That's a vibe. You know, I'm, I'm pretty regimented. Like, I know, like, you know, I, I usually start at a certain time and I finish at a certain time. And when, it, when it's that time, I'm just like, you know, this, I know what I'm going to work on. I have my days pretty, pretty much planned out. That helps me where, you know, I mean, sometimes there's rogue waves of things pop up, but most of the time I know what I'm working on. And um, that just, you know, that works for me as an artist, just, all right, this is my day. This, this is what I want to get through. And, you know, hopefully I get through that. Sometimes I get through more, sometimes I get through less, but um, I don't know. I think just, you know, working on productions and films and video games and, you know, working for art directors, you just get a sense of like their schedules. We live in a world of schedules and you just kind of have to figure that out. So even when you work for yourself, um, I, that's just something I've implemented where I'm very, I have schedules and um, it just helps me, you know, get to where I want to go. Uh -huh. I So we, we've shown kind of like your illustrator, which by the way, illustrator is terrible. Uh, <laughs> for those of you for knowing illustrator, I, I don't understand it, but you do another series um, of call, it's called Birchwood Art Pieces, I believe. Yeah. Um, and they're just bright, colorful, painted. We have a uh, pinkorama. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that series came because I was like, "What?" I I wanted to kind of like tap into like what. So like growing up, my mom used to decorate kind of mid-century modern, and we just had like that that wood with that um, that stain, and that just reminded me of my childhood. And then I'm like, I want to you know put some fun images over that. And I wanted it to be, you know, hand touched and painted. Um, I love shapes. So if you look at my artwork, it's not like super rendered out, you know, all these gradations and all that. I just love coming up with shapes. And so a lot of my artwork is just like, if I can come up with like a strong, fun shape and, you know, come up with a design for, you know, a flamingo, um, put it on some wood, like, um, that piece, like sometimes I create for other people. I'm very thoughtful of like, I want to create something that, I think people will enjoy. And then there's sometimes as an artist, there's just like, there's a, there's something in you that you're just like, I just want to paint this. I don't care if anybody ever buys it. So, um, so this series kind of started with, I don't care if anybody ever buys it, but then actually people have, you know, added pieces to their collection, which is always fun. So <laughs> I've had one I've been eyeing for a long time. Yeah. I have a spot for it. Uh, it's a cat. It's a kitty cat. Um, and it's giant. Some of these are absolutely giant. Oh, the, yeah, that one was actually painted on a door. Oh, really? Yeah. I think that's you why it's that. so big. Yeah. yeah we, we've got, uh, we can pull up a picture. Uh, yeah, I think you had two of them. One of them sold. Yeah, the sister piece sold. So that went to a collector in Denver. 
And then, um, yeah, so this one, it's painted on a hollow door because I was like, I wanted it on wood, but I didn't want it to weigh like a million pounds. Yeah. So I went to like uh, Home Depot and I had like 20 doors just lined up and I'm just like looking at the wood grains and people are like, what is this guy doing? And I'm just like, cause it had to have like this, you know, I knew where certain pieces were going to be. So I wanted a coal wood grain. And so I picked it out and um, I love big art. I've always loved, you know, art that when you hang it, it's like, you know, it's unapologetically huge <laughs> and not everybody can have a, you know, a space for that. But, you know, this is one of many pieces. I have, you know, some that are like, you know, four by five feet, you know, there's three more cat paintings are exact same size, but a slightly different style. So I love large, you know, big pieces of art. I always have. I just think they're super fun. Oh, it's like a big, it's a statement piece, right? Yeah. Like this deserves a big spot in my, in my house, in my apartment. Right. I'm, of this. I'm excited. <laughs> like this speaks to me. You know, I don't want a postcard. I want the, I want the whole wall. Yeah. And I think it's fun too, because you can see, you know, where I painted it. You can see. Um, so with these ones, I like the flat color. And so. I actually, all of the paint supplies for this came from Home Depot. There's like, I didn't go to an art store. So it's like interior house paint. I'm using like small rollers because I wanted nice flat. I didn't, I didn't want to brush strokes. I just wanted everything flat and, you know, masked it off with painter's tape and, um, you know, then put like, you know, um, just a nice coat over it. So like everything for this came from Home Depot. Um, which might sound funny, but I'm just like, you know, whatever makes, whatever makes it look good, that's what I'll do. So that's that's where you know kind of the, the heart behind that piece yep 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 pretty impressive <laughs> turning stuff from home depot into that right <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah there was another comment on here that i liked uh from early arriver uh scooter art for the vegas sphere the, Ooh, that, the sphere um, that just opened in vegas that is a big canvas uh so early arriver i think you yeah, that's a good one so far, man. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations to early arrivers. Send me an email at men at searchfortiki.com at men at searchfortiki.com and claim your bar mat. Congratulations, early arrivers. Congratulations. Um, speaking of Vegas, uh, maybe we can pull up a, a piece from, from Vegas that you've done, but uh, Vegas, Palm Springs, you know, I know you love mid-century modern art. You've done a lot of Vegas art too. Do you prefer uh, Palm Springs or do you prefer Las Vegas? Yes. Yes, I do. Both. Yes. Both. <laughs> we're, we're actually going, we leave uh, a week from tomorrow for Palm Springs for uh, Modernism Week. So. Okay. Yeah. So I'm so psyched. So that's, that's coming up um, and we'll be there Friday nights, like the opening party and then Saturday and, and then it closes down Sunday. So the fall preview is kind of like a smaller version of the big one, which is in February. So we're getting ready to head out there next week. So like, or, you know, the room by the front door is just full of art. We're just getting everything ready for that. So, but I love Vegas. Like the very first place I ever went to in Vegas was Circus Circus. I was in third grade. Um, we had a Shasta trailer and Circus Circus actually had a trailer park. So we were like hitting all the national parks. It was like this massive family trip is painful, but big family trip. And so we went to Vegas and we stayed at the Circus Circus and uh, I just fell in love with it. And they had this, it, it's right when Space Invaders was coming out. And like, I was just, I could not play Space Invaders enough. And so they had that at the Circus Circus. And then while you're playing video games, you'd hear the slot machines going. I just was always curious, like, oh yeah, Jason sees a, a little something in the moon. So um, so I just fell in love with Vegas from a very young age. And so it definitely makes itself into some of the art. All the bright lights and, and all yeah. that. Does that bed actually exist somewhere? Is that it, like a style? You know what? I spent so much time researching, like, what is the coolest piece of furniture? So like a lot of my art is like, I can't own this. But if I put it in art, I feel like I kind of own it. So it was, that's <laughs> that was a real bed. So I'm like, that is so going in, you know, a certain piece. So um, I'll find certain pieces of furniture and I'll hold on to them for a while while I'm just like, you know, where can I put this? But I saw that bed. I'm like, oh my gosh, that just looks like some crazy Vegas bed. <laughs> it's so, got to go in the piece. And I do, I love all the, uh, the iconic, uh, you know, Vegas signs in the background. And it looks like uh, maybe a little promiscuous in the in, in the narration. Little something's happening. Yep. 
Yeah, a couple heels. Heels. Uh, heels have been removed, and uh, mm -hmm. they're on different stairs. So, yep. you know. just leading down to the <laughs> to whatever's going to happen next. So, you even got the uh, the beam um, yeah. on the window, kind of like leading the eye. It's the direction that. Yep. Uh, they're headed. Perhaps. Yeah. So this is from the Frankie series. So I want to do a piece that celebrated like the life and times of Frank Sinatra. And so they're just based off of my ideas of like, you know, maybe what his life was like. And, um, you know, him in Vegas was like, um, I just love listening to like the, you know, Frank talk to the crowd. Like I love his music, but man, when you get to hear like on Spotify where like, he's just, you know, having fun with the crowd or like the Rat Pack is together. Um, and they're just like joking with each other. Like, I just love the banter from that. I think it has so much life. Um, so, you know, Sinatra is like, you know, I think he's probably, I, I love Johnny Cash and I love Frank Sinatra. Like those are two of my favorite artists. <laughs> what about, I, I know you've done Bond. Yes. I, so Do you have yeah. a favorite Bond? Yeah, gosh. You know, I grew up with Roger, I grew up with Roger Moore, and people are very like, this can be a divisive question. <laughs> well, so this is this is my theory. Yeah, it's just whoever you grew up with, like I whoever so. the first Bond that you watched is, that tends to be your favorite. That's how it was with me. So I think Roger Moore was definitely more kind of cartoony, campy, you know, compared to like you know Sean Connery or even some of the later ones. But I love them all. Like I just love a good James Bond you know, movie. So we actually worked on a pitch. So part of being an artist is like, who, who do I want to work for? And so, yeah, shake and not stirred. So we worked on a pitch for Bond that was very specific to characters and we pitched it to them, you know, just to see if we could put a deal together. And they, they're like, no, we don't think so because they said, oh, no. yeah, it's, I put so much work into it, but I didn't carry it. I had fun working on it. This, this piece is not from it, but um, so I don't know. It was fun. So like lots of times as an artist, it's like, you know, who do we want to work with? So, so uh, Pan Am, we just signed a, a five year deal with Pan America and we're working on a cocktail art book that's going to celebrate their history. So that was somebody that we're like, we would love to work with them. So we reached out to them and have an amazing relationship with them. So that's one of the fun, fun things as an artist, like who, who could we partner with? Like who would be a super fun, you know, to, a collaboration? Like Gabe, you're fun to collaborate with. So it's like finding <laughs> you, like businesses that are like. See, when you say that, it makes it sound like that maybe some people, uh, not so much. <laughs> no, you definitely, it's like, um, so, you know, I look at it as dating. Like when, when you know, um, so my wife, Chris, and I, we run our business together. We're like, if there's somebody we're interested in working in with, we'll do, we'll kind of do a dating you know, part with them, like, hey, let's not start off all in, like, you know, let's start off just a spoke of our business, let's work, you know, create a series or something based on that, and just see how everybody feels. So there's kind of like a dating thing. And then, you know, depending on how that goes, then you could be like, oh, my gosh, that was amazing. We love working with you guys, vice versa, like there's a love connection. And then you can like, hey, let's do another project on that. So so there's the dating. <laughs> we got to do we got to do another the project Scott. I know, I it's know. It's been too long. I bet for those I bet Mike we're drinking out of this mug all night. You made this mug with us. You made oh, the yeah. bar mats. Uh you did our 13 nights of Tiki Frights logo. You did the search for Tiki logo. We also now run the New England Tiki Society. Dude. In Boston, which is uh like a community. We do events once a month. It doesn't really have a logo. So mm -hmm. you know if you feel like designing a New England Tiki Society logo. Dude, that'd be fun. You're awesome to work with. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't just say that. Like, you are super fun to work with. And one of my oh, favorite things you. about you is like when we were at Tiki Oasis, um, is what you're like the connector. Like, you just <laughs> have this ability to know people. Um, and just people enjoy being around you. They enjoy like, um, you know, when you stop by, they're like, "Ooh, Gabe's here," and just you have like, there's something in you that everybody has. I think you, it's an amazing skill that you have. It's a gifting where like, you're able to like, I think being, bring people together for collaborations or um, whatever it is you're going for. Like you're such a connector of people. So I that's think that's very kind, dude. Yeah. Like, <laughs> thank I, you so much. I, I'm not like that, but you were so like that. So you rock at that. We just had uh, Andy uh, say more Mai Tai glasses. I think this will be the last one. But I agree with that sentiment. Yeah. So, Andy, bar mat, baby. Getting a, a bar mat. I agree with that. Uh, email us at admin at searchfortiki.com. That's admin at searchfortiki.com.
um, claim your bar mat. That'll be the last one for tonight. Um, speaking of more Mai Tai glasses, uh, you did our Naughty Cat Mai Tai glasses. I think we can pull up yeah. the of those. Yeah, that's what I'm... I love... Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. These are completely sold out. People, people love these things. Uh, but it's a series of cats messing with teeth. And uh, so fun, dude. I love I was That was the concept I sent you, just cats messing up tiki mugs and all these illustrations you came up with. Pulled, pulled right out of that noodle and it was like such, that's why I love collaborating with you because you get all these stories. But um, this artwork in particular, I believe you can buy right now. If you mm -hmm. want, you can't get the Mai Tai glasses. They're sold out. But nope. if you want to own a piece of uh, scooter art uh, and a piece of the search for tiki uh, history, you can get the concept art for those on Scooter's website right now. Yep. That's pretty cool. Um, under, I think it's called like original concept art on the website. Yeah, artistscooter.com. It's under, yeah, original concept drawings. Mm -hmm. um, that was such a fun project to work on, the Mai Tai glasses. Because you were just yeah. like, yeah, just cats doing crazy stuff with, with you know, tiki glasses. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's so fun. So I, and that was, was that the first thing we did? Was that, or was it the logo? No, it would have been the logo. Okay, but the then logo. there's also with the Mai Tai glass for people that don't know uh, the, I don't, I don't know, I don't have one on me, but the, when they're printing, the machine has to hold on to a part of the Mai Tai glass and it prints around. So there's a three quarter inch gap in the colors mm -hmm. on the Mai Tai glass. So you actually have to design it, but then you have to shift the, the colors, you know, slightly to the right or left so that the that it looks like it's a seamless wrap but yeah. if you look closely it's missing a color three quarter inch of the color on mm -hmm. you know, each side so that's one and of the, the quality on these glasses the might like dude you nailed it like these are just the quality that's, is awesome that's the culture color. cove and uh culture cove south pacific promotions if you want my tech glasses go to them john and G. go to them they're yeah because their quality is amazing yeah. you can put them in the dishwasher you don't have to worry about it burning away i still don't do that i hand wash them you don't have to you can put them in the dishwasher i'm too scared i'm gonna hand wash too scared <laughs> okay <laughs> dude we're over an hour do you mind if we go another 10 15 minutes yeah we can do that you want to go um, two and a half hours <laughs> no i don't i don't want to go two and a half hours I I that, was, that was too much <laughs> but but yeah. i do want to talk to you i so i was when i was doing the uh the uh Coming up with the interview questions for tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay, Angela is in the living room on the other side, um, and uh, she, she's playing a video game. And all all of a sudden, she hears me exclaim, "Holy shit!" <laughs> okay, and I go running across the apartment to the other room to our, like the office storage tiki whatever space because I am a collector of this is super nerdy, but Magic the Gathering cards. Oh, dude. And they did a set last year called Infinity. Mm -hmm. And Infinity is kind of a weird, every once in a while, Magic the Gathering does a set that's kind of uh, just an oddball set that makes you do weird things. Okay. So mm -hmm. Magic the Gathering is kind of like the strategy game. Infinity is more like the party game brought mm -hmm. into Magic. And uh, you designed a whole ton of showcase cards for Infinity. I had no idea. I've been sitting on your artwork. Um, and then as soon as I realized that, of course, you know, the art stands out as being your Oh, that's artwork. so awesome. Uh, but yeah, guys, he's worked with Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. So I am curious, how did this come about, doing showcase cards for Magic the Gathering? You know, I think it's, I actually think it was Google. So I think um, the art director was like, you know, mid-century modern artist. And uh, I'm pretty sure because I asked her and I'm like, how did you find me for this? And she's like, uh, I think I just Googled it. So so my name popped up and then they went to my website and, you know, it's kind of look, you know, what I was up to and reached out and they're like, hey, we'd love you to design some cards. And so I think I did nine to begin with. And then they had like another uh, eight, eight more after that. So I did two sets for them. They were so awesome to work with, like. Um, they basically were like, you know, they're, they, they had an idea of what they were thinking and they're like, just kind of come up with your version of it. And so, um, the art direction was awesome, you know, super friendly to work with. And they just wanted me to come up, you know, with characters in my style, which is always the best, you know, when I'm working with somebody where they're just like, we want your style and, you know, just see what you come up with. And those are always like super fun projects. And so that's how it was working with them. And, you got the freedom. Um, 
And dude, it's it's your jam. The Infinity set is like yeah. Describe it. It's like mid-century modern sci-fi amusement park. Oh, it's so fun. It was so fun to work on. So yeah, like each time they gave me a character, I'm like, oh, it's gonna be this is gonna be so fun. This is my favorite one. And like it just every card they gave me just kept getting, you know, better and better and better. So here's some more concept art. Guys, if you're mm -hmm. a fan of Magic the Gathering, how often do you get to own original concept art that became cards? You can do that. Um, mm -hmm. because Scott Burroughs has a section on his website. Uh, I think it's called Wizards of the Coast. In the links, you go to Art Wizards of the Coast. You can buy original concept art for all of these Infinity cards. Super cool. I haven't well, chosen just, which one I'm going to buy yet. You know what? <laughs> just because we're buds, I'll send you. So when you're the artist, you do it. They send you a bunch of artist proof cards where it just has the art on the front and the back is blank. Oh my God. Well, I'm going to hook you up with a set of that with the cards. You'd I be my hero. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're already my hero. But... Hero for life, buddy. Yeah, I'll do that. I'd love, I'd love for you to have those. <laughs> I have a ton because they send me like they send you a lot. So, so I'll hook you up with some of those. Use the man. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta, we gotta. Yes, I think I might. I think Gabe might cry. So <laughs> we gotta change the, the topic quickly here, so I don't fall apart. But um, I have to talk about. You just came out with a cocktail book mm -hmm. with your wife, um, the Mid Mod Happy Hour. Cocktail yes. Book. I'm like the world's worst bartender. World's worst bartender. <laughs> I am. I'm, we're like, whore. I spill half of it or whatever. But <laughs> we we came up with the idea of like, you know, let's come up with a book where we're gonna like, we're gonna go on an adventure. We're gonna, you know, take whoever wants to watch us. You know, we we go live on Friday nights and we will try cocktails that we've never tried before. Some of them are like, you know, people recommend them and. So we try them out and just kind of let people know what we think of them, like if we would change something. And so we started doing that. We're like, um, I think like two weeks into we're like, dude, we should just do a book. It was very kind of flippant, like, yeah, let's just do a book. And we're like, actually, that would be super fun. So we're like, let's come up with some recipes that we enjoy. Um, try to have a try to make it where like if you buy, you know, alcohol for one drink, you could use it in several of the recipes. Mm -hmm. And then come up with art that just like there's different flavors of cocktails, we wanted the art to kind of have different flavors, you know, in the style. So it's still my style, but there's like slightly different flavors, I, I guess I would call it with the art. So um, and we released that this summer and we were like it did it. It's it's gone really well. It was a big surprise. We're like, is anybody going to like this? You know, because we self-published and all that. And it it's done really well. And and so now people are like. Um, so now we're working on the second book, the one we're going to do with with Pan Am. And so we're getting like new recipes for that. Um, so we're still doing we typically go live. Uh, we call it, you know, live at five on Friday or whatever. And so yep. um, and we'll just try out different ones and let people know what we think. And then we're always asking, like, if you've got a recipe you want us to try, let us know. And so I didn't really think I was going to like cocktails that much. And then the more we make them, I'm like, <laughs> what these, are you, these dude, are really your, good. Your profile picture on art of scooter like about me it's you my martini. Oh, martini glass yeah well i was very limited i guess in what <laughs> cocktails i tried but now we have tried so many um and so now i can look at something i'm like i think i'll like this or let's try it but i don't think i'm gonna like it um but some of them are so good so the ones we really love make it into the book was there anyone uh that uh, was so horrific and did, did not make it into the book. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm trying. I probably blocked it out. I can't remember. We have like a file of some that we tried that really weren't good. I don't really like super dry cocktails. Um, okay. I like citrus. Like, um, I don't like super sweet, but I like a little bit of sweet. So um, I think if there's anything that's really dry, then I'm like, eh, you know, not that I hate it, but I probably wouldn't drink it again. So. But that's how you learn. It's like you try something, you're like, yeah, I don't like super dry drinks. So you gotta taste it to find out. Yeah. You gotta taste it to find out. Yeah. Um, but it's been fun, you know, doing that and just um it's fun engaging with other people. So we typically will make a cocktail and then we we just come up with random questions to like, you know, uh Christy will ask me or I'll ask her, and then we ask, you know, the people who are watching. And most, you know, lots of times people are, you know, having a drink or two. And so like, you just ask these random questions. It's such a fun way to get to know people and like, you know, hear about people's experience. And so 
I love going you know, on Fridays, you know, when we do that. It's so, it's so Every time, amazing. dude, every time I get the notification, I'm in there. Like, <laughs> yeah, you get it. Yeah. It's always good because you guys, uh, you ask some, some funny questions. Yeah, it's so fun. Like, I really enjoy it. It's not work at all. It's just like, let's just make cocktails and talk to our people and see, I don't know, see what's going on with them and ask crazy questions. So I love that. Me too. And yeah. if people want to follow you, uh, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually yeah. Art of Scooter, I believe. Art of Scooter. Art of Scooter. Uh, yeah. We can pull up the website. So if people want to uh, purchase your art, they go to artofscooter.com. Yeah. Um, if you're well, looking for can... con concept art, uh, so you go to the art art tab, and then there's concept art. The Wizards of the Coast has its own, own tab if you're looking for that. Mm -hmm. um, they also have the giant cat cat print you can pick that up you can pick up the the pink orama flamingo here's the website here yeah and we're doing uh 10 off right now if you use the code jolly it's 10 off all regular prints and uh most merchandise so just as we Cooler. hit the holidays your coupon code is jolly it is jolly it is too early <laughs> I know, I'm because we, you know, being in business for yourself, we have like an awesome Christmas store. Okay, I know you don't want to hear about Christmas, but we have like <laughs> fun Christmas stuff. You can look at it November first. November first. But, um, but everyone else, if you, you know, if you are one of those if crazy you want Christmas, people, you can go to the Christmas store and yeah. So all you crazy cats. Yeah. I watch Christmas like you know Christmas in July. I just love all that stuff. So good Christmas. I, I do do Christmas in July. Okay. I, do that. Just I just have to make space for Halloween because I love Halloween so much. I, I get you. Sure. I get you. you have to <laughs> and this is your Instagram. So yeah, your handle Art of Scooter. Follow him on Instagram and make sure yep. you you click the bell notifications live stream so that you get notifications every time Scooter goes live with his wife. Um, and then uh, da, 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 looking ahead, dude. Yeah, um, you're, you're working with you're working with Pan Am. That's yeah, crazy. so working with Pan Am, um, we're this is super early, but we're working with another company where we're um, kind of a collaboration. We're going to be putting out a series of kind of travel adventure art, which um, you know probably about twelve pieces, and so that'll be coming out. I think mid, I don't know, maybe spring or or summer. And then there was one other thing I, I was hoping I could announce to you. It's a big announcement, but that'll probably be coming out in a week. I was supposed to hear okay. about it from other stuff, but so. Um, that just gives people more reason to follow yes. Art of Scooter yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, really, I'm, really, uh, I'm really excited about what we have coming up and um, just having a blast, you know. Uh, I think when I was when I was young, in high school or even beginning with college, I thought business was like the most boring thing in the world. I'm like, I hate, I would never go into business. I don't want to take business classes. And the longer I've done this, like I actually enjoy the business side of it. I enjoy trying to learn how to do something well and how to market and all of that. So um, that's just, you know, this year we've had a really big push. We went out to uh, Vegas um, for their big licensing show uh, in June. And just made some awesome contacts and so it's just opening up some fun doors that you know we'll, we'll be announcing over the next year or so it just goes to show you know 20 years ago when disney closed its doors i imagine that was probably a pretty uh pretty brutal brutal time in one's had, life not just your life but any artist i had the worst job i ever had in my life right after disney it was this place oh. i'm not going to say what it was called but it was like uh do you know the movie office space Inotech? It was the, the same. <laughs> it was the same vibe as that, and oh, it was like it was like the most uh, humbling, difficult job I ever. I was just coming from this this high. I think it humbled me, but it really I hated being there, and that's really, you know, that really got me to the point where I'm like, I can't work. I can't work like that. Like I want to be in business for myself. I want to be a fine artist. I want to be an illustrator, and that being at that place really helped me. Uh, it encouraged me to pursue dream you know my dream of getting out on my own so it was difficult but it definitely got me to where you know i am today so great grateful where i am today <laughs> when one door closes another one opens yeah totally and there's totally. a lot of people's dreams to be a full-time successful artist that uh you know doesn't doesn't have to answer to a, a corporate mouse yeah you know, yeah your own thing. it's true so we'll leave that on i got i got two more questions for you okay that's it 
if someone wants to 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 be uh, you know a full time artist, do you have any advice for them on where to start? Yeah, like I I've worked with a lot of uh, high school students um, just through the years, and um, you know they come to the end of high you know get close to graduation. I'm always like if you're gonna if you want to become an artist, um, I would spend time looking into a great college. And, um, you know, I first started at a community college just because I couldn't afford art school. But as soon as I could, that's where I went to Academy of Art University. And that really, the the level of the teaching there really got me to where, you know, with Barbara Bradley, which I shared earlier, just the level of teachers that like, my favorite teachers are the ones that are so busy in the industry that they can maybe teach one or two classes, but they're, they're in the industry. And I think you get a lot of that in a good art school. And so I always encourage like, you know, students, you know, high school students, or even like anybody's wanting to go back, like, I think going to school, a great art school will like get you so far, so like a lot faster than if you're trying to learn it on your own or going to a, you know, maybe a college or something that doesn't, it's just, you know, the teachers aren't that good. So I'm always like, find a great art school and go to it. Um, lots of times people are like, well, I can't afford it. I'm going to have to get student loans. I'm always like, D you're investing in yourself. Like that is an amazing investment. A student loan in yourself is a great investment. Don't worry about it. Like do that. So I'm always like invest in yourself and find an amazing art school that is teaching what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And learn about business. That's always good. Learn about you can business. Do that anytime. Sure. You can do that anytime. And yeah. thankfully we got YouTube now. We got, YouTube. yeah. We got, you know, so it's always evolving. It totally is. You can jump in because even the people that have been doing this for 50 years, you know, you think maybe they have a leg up on you, but they're just one app away from having to learn everything over again. It's so, so, true. <laughs> it's so true. Like an example would be when when COVID was really like massive and like everybody was at home. Um, art, it was really easy to sell art. Like we go live and like, you know, people are at home they're not going out. So they're just like sitting there like buying, you know, stuff. And so it was really easy to sell art. And then as things open back up, then you have to get more cle clever, like how do we continue to market? You know, people aren't as home, they're going on vacations, all this kind of other stuff. So you're always learning like how, you know, maybe it worked this year, but what's gonna work next year. So it's, it's that, it's like a puzzle. You're always trying to figure it out. And as soon as you stop trying to figure it out, that's when it goes bad, so. That's it. One more question, then we're going to give away this gorgeous mug from Emporium 32. So the last question I got for you, Scooter, commissions. Yeah. We talked a little bit about it. Are you open for commissions right now? You know, commissions are like the favorite thing I get to do with people yeah. because um, I get to hear their personal story. And so um, commissions are open, but I love it because I get you know, typically when we do it, somebody's like, hey, I want to work on a commission, but I don't know what I want. And sometimes people are nervous to work with an artist. And I'm like, I'm not very scary. I'm like, we're going to work together. It's going to be fun, I promise. And so we work together and we're like, you know, coming up with like, what tells your story? And so lots of times people are like, what well, is my story worth telling? I'm like, your story is always worth telling. It's you, like your, your friends, your family, like they want to celebrate you. So coming up with a custom piece of artwork that celebrates like who you are as a person. I'm just like, that is, that is so worth it. And then I just, I feel humbled at times because I get to hear these amazing stories that, you know, usually are reserved for family or friends of, of who they are. And so like, I'm just like, how can I tell this person, like this person's amazing, how, or this family is amazing or, you know, their kids, or how do I, how do I portray that in a piece of art? So we work together, um, we kind of figure out what the story is, the process is, there's like, there's questions. I take a ton of notes um, and then I do a sketch and then I'll present the sketch and I kind of do a video with the sketch and I tell them why I did this, like this is placed here because of this and, you know, certain things. And then once they approve the sketch, then that's the, the next time they see it's going to be the finished art because I want there to be that like surprise factor. So I typically, the, they, they see the sketch, they're like, okay, I like the sketch. I'm like, okay, so I get to coloring. And then the art piece arrives and sometimes we do a reveal where I'm just like, get a cocktail, you know, get a box opener. I'm going to have a cocktail. I want to see what it looks like when you open this piece of art. And so they get to open it and they look at it for the first time. Um, I've got to do, um, last year I got to do one in person, which was awesome. Um, 
But oh, was a reveal? Of, like you dropped it off in person? Yeah, like um, we were doing Palm Springs and we drove into Dana Point to, to visit one of our collectors who ordered one. So I got to do it in person, which was super fun. But most of the times it's virtual like this. But I just love that when people see it and then they see themselves, um, they see their story and they just look at it. And then they're so excited to share it with people. And so commissions are one of my favorite things. It's, it's like one of my, gosh, a great friend, his name's Bill, did a commission with him. We just became awesome friends. And so like, it's just a great way to get to know people and also just to celebrate them through a piece of art. So, so I do have commissions open right now. Um, kind of, it's getting close to like, if you want it by the holidays, we'd have to get it going on pretty quick. But um, yep. yeah, I got you. Dude, there. you meet your deadlines. <laughs> I get deadlines, Gabe. That's I can cool. say I've worked with a lot of artists and deadlines that, you know, that's a, that's a struggle for a lot of people, uh, yeah. but, but not scooter scooter meets deadlines. <laughs> and a hundred percent dude, like I, we, we hadn't talked that much until, until we collaborated on the logo and mm -hmm. uh, as, as you know, looking back on it now that you said that, as soon as we, we made that logo, I felt like, Oh, scooter's my best friend now. Oh, right yeah. back at you, man. <laughs> and uh, it was, it was totally um, one of my favorite moments in, in my four years of being in Tiki was seeing the sketch, okay? And then getting that PDF file in your email, <laughs> the full color thing, because it was, it was just like, boom, super oh, cool God. reveal. So I love that. Guys, hit up Scooter for your, uh, for your art commissions. With that said, it's time to give away this mug. Once again, this is from Emporium 32. Emporium 32 uh, is a shop in Salem, Massachusetts. It's the center of spook here in New England. And um, they're really awesome people, Nick and Jillian. Kudos to them. Um, if you are not the lucky winner tonight, you can purchase this mug still. I think they have a handful of them left at Emporium32.com. Um, so check it out. Get your Tiki Bob, iconic Tiki Bob face on uh, the jack o lantern and bob o lantern With that said, let's take a closer look at the mug, and then we are going to announce the winner. And the winner is, congratulations to Erica. Erica, uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce your last name. I apologize. Uh, but it is down there on the little ticker. Uh, congratulations, Erica. You have won the Bobble Lantern mug from Emporium 32. Send us an email at admin at search for Tiki within 14 days to claim your prize. And then we'll ship it out to you. And with that said, guys, uh, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure. I always have the best time talking to you. Uh, we're going to have to do this again because I think I have another 5,000 questions for your time at Disney and, uh, and beyond. There's so much we could talk about. but It's a super fun game. A real Thank treat. you so much, buddy. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good night. We're going to see you this Thursday. We have another special guest. And we'll announce all that, all those details soon. Have a good night, guys.